see, are we still missing somebody back there? Or was, oh yeah, that was uh, Kelsey's not here yet. One of the Kelsey's. Yeah, oh, there you are, you're hiding over there now. So. Okay, let's see. Kale must be hiding out somewhere, so we'll give him 30 seconds. There's one more. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. We're down one, but hopefully he'll show up. So um, this afternoon we start talking about hydrolyte. So I'm curious, uh, out of you guys, how many people had never heard of hydrolyte till you got here? So one, two, three, so like a third. How many people have heard of it, but you've never run it? So that's another third. And how many people have actually run hydrolyte before? So there's, there's the other third. That's where a fourth, whatever. So that's about the way it usually turns out. Okay, so anyway, hydrolyte is software that solves the radiative transfer equation for you. And what I'm going to do this afternoon is give you, as fast as possible, a little run-through of what hydrolyte does and what it does not do. And then I'll do a couple of runs for you. And then I'll give you a lab handout with a bunch of problems uh, to just do some very simple runs and, you know, get the answer. And so for tomorrow's lab, we'll have a short lab report where you just say, this is what I learned. And, you know, this was the, que the answer to question number three. And then on, it's either Thursday or Friday when we have the second lab, I'll have a lecture on closure in general and show you some examples there of people that have used hydrolyte to get very good closure between what they measured and what they uh, predicted in hydrolyte. And then the second lab will do more advanced things like how to read in AC9 and ACS data and read in your sky data and do this and do that and you know build up water IOPs from many different components. But today will just be the simplest runs we can do and then uh, we'll just take it from there then you guys will be able to use this for the rest of the class. Okay, so the bottom line for my overview here, as quick as possible, but it'll still take a while, is just what is the physical model? What's hydrolyte doing for solving a physical problem? Uh, there's always a computational model, which is how does it actually do these calculations, and a little bit about how you use it. I'll say a brief word about the software package you got today. I'll do some runs, and then we'll take it from there. Uh, as I've already said, the code you have runs only on computers with some version of Microsoft Windows. And, you know, feel free to work together. Uh, how many people have installed it, and it seems to have gone okay? So there's, you know, four, five, six, you know, seven, whatever. We're good there. There's always somebody with some weird problem that, it doesn't like because of some security setting on Windows where it says uh, access violation. I won't let you copy this file onto the system directory or who knows what. And, uh, you know, somebody usually comes out of the woodwork that knows how to solve that problem. Like uh, Nils was, it wasn't installing on Anastasia's computer from the CD, but it would install from a thumb drive, you know. And I'm not a computer science person, so I don't know how that stuff works. but. 
anyway, once we do get it installed, it'll put out the correct answer. That's all I can guarantee. Okay, so let's just continue. We, we saw this today. I don't need to repeat it, but Hydrolyte is going to solve the 1D radiative transfer equation, and it doesn't know anything about the ocean. So you're going to have to put in the IOPs. You're going to have to tell it where the sun is in the sky. If it's, you know, four meters deep water and it's got grass, seagrass on the bottom, you're going to have to tell it that. It doesn't know anything. That's a downside in that you have to specify all of the inputs. It's also good because if you put in the IOPs for a bucket of orange paint, it'll solve for the radiance distribution in the paint and leaving the paint so because it really doesn't know anything about the ocean it's that just the input tells it that you're in the ocean and people do occasionally use it for completely non-oceanic problems they just put in the IOPs for their medium whatever it happens to be okay and as I said this morning uh, we're going to give it all the things underlined in green and it's going to solve for the radiance distribution and then all the irradiances, reflectances, K functions, all of those things are computed by integrating the radiance distribution over wavelength or taking derivatives with depth or whatever it happens to be. So it, it uses uh, just the definitions of irradiances, reflectances, and so forth, but they're obtained from the radiance distribution. And uh, so we're going to give it IOPs, we're going to give it internal sources, I don't think we'll do much with that in here, but a little bit, and we have to tell it what are the boundary conditions at the surface and the bottom, and that's going to be done by specifying the wind speed, so we know the waves on the surface, we tell it where the sun is in the sky, it's a clear sky, it's a cloudy sky, whatever, and then that <coughs> gives it the <coughs> the surface boundary conditions and then the bottom boundary conditions will either say let it be infinitely deep or make it five meters deep with a coral bottom whatever that happens to be okay uh, then uh, I've already talked about this so physically what we're going to solve it's a time independent problem so you can't use hydrolyte to study something like a laser pulse that's on nanosecond scale of time you know it's just not doing that it's solving a time independent problem so if you think of going out here and making a measurement let's say of, of water leaving reflectance over a period of a minute you've averaged out all the waves and so forth and you've got kind of the answer that corresponds to what hydrolyte gives whereas if you took an instantaneous measurement you might have wave focusing or something and you know half a second later you'd get a different answer but if you average together a minute's worth of data then that's kind of corresponds to what hydrolyte uh, is solving and it's one spatial dimension but there's no restrictions on how the IOPs can vary with depth some models you have to break them up into homogeneous layers hydrolyte doesn't do that there's no restriction on the wavelengths except that it has to be between 300 and 1,000 nanometers. And that range is set actually by all the databases that are in, inside Hydrolyte that specify things like, you know, phytoplankton absorption and scattering coefficients and sky radiance distribu irradiance distributions and so on. And those databases are the thing that's limited. And if you wanted to run Hydrolyte down to 200 nanometers, well, you could do that, but what's the absorption by phytoplankton at 200 nanometers? Well, I don't know. It's never been measured. So that's why it's restricted to these wavelengths here, which is most all of what you need to do. Uh, the air water surface is modeled using what are Cox Monk, called Cox Monk wind speed wave slope statistics. That's good enough for most people. The next version, I'm going to improve that a little bit, but it's good enough for us. Uh, you can have specify the bottom boundary various ways. Hydrolyte, this invariant embedding technique that it uses includes inherent in the mathematics all orders of multiple scattering. So there's none of this single scattering kind of stuff or anything like that. In, you could think of there's an infinite series here unscattered plus first order plus second order plus third order. 
the successive order of scattering approximations solves for each of those terms individually and then adds them up. Well, hydrolyte just solves for the sum to begin with. So it includes all multiple scattering. Uh, you can either turn on Raman scattering by the water or turn it off. You can turn on CDOM and chlorophyll fluorescence and turn it off. So if you wanted to do a run and say, you know, I'm going to ignore Raman scattering, you do a run without it, redo the same run and turn on Raman scattering, and then you can see how much difference it makes in something like a remote sensing reflectance. Uh, you can add things like bioluminescing layers. We're not going to do that in here. The biggest limits is that it does not include polarization. That's the biggest inaccuracy in hydrolyte. And what that means is for the radiances, if you're looking in this direction versus that direction and you do not include polarization, the radiance hydrolyte computes might be 10% too big in this direction and 10% too small in that direction. But when you compute something like an irradiance, the big and the small tend to average out and your irradiances are probably good to better than 1% even if the radiance in a particular direction might be off by a bit. And it doesn't have things like white cap effects for the surface, but that's generally not a problem. Now, for the, computationally, what it does is it takes the set of all directions and divides it up into sort of a latitude, longitude grid of little windows. And what it computes inside each little window, so here's theta and phi, so this little window goes from maybe 30 to 40 degrees, and phi might maybe from 30 to 45 degrees, something like that. There are 10 degrees in theta, 15 degrees in phi. And it's going to compute the radiance averaged over that little window. So you could just think of, if we look at the windows in the back of the room, and I have a radiometer with a really narrow field of view, if I shine it at the left, or point it at the left part of the window, versus the right part, I might get a different radiance because I'm looking at, you know, the dark forest in one spot and I'm looking at a bright something in the other spot. But if I replaced each of those windows with frosted glass, then every point within each window, I would just be seeing the average radiance over that window. So that's basically what hydrolyte's doing. It's computing averages over little solid angles corresponding to each of those windows. And uh, any kind of numerical model, whether it's hydrolyte or discrete ordinance or Monte Carlo or anything else, some way has to discretize the problem because conceptually the radiance has an infinite number of directions, an infinite number of wavelengths or a continuous function of wavelength. It's continuous with depth, but you have to end up with a finite number of things that a computer can compute. So we're going to have a finite number of these little directions, we're going to have a finite number of wavelength bands, and we're going to save the output at a finite number of depths. So that's the way hydrolyte discretizes the continuous problem so that what you're computing here when I say, oh, here's the radiance at, you know, 30 degrees in theta and 45 degrees in phi, well, it's really the average over a little window centered at 30 and a little window centered at 45 in phi. And so you could think of it as an integral averaged over solid angle, averaged over some wavelength band, let's say 400 to, uh, to 410 nanometers, and the printout might call that 405. But you kind of have to remember, well, it's really the average from 400 to 410, even if I call it 405 in the output. And, uh, okay, so I mentioned this morning some computational advantages. It's the runtime is linearly proportional to the optical depth. That's a big deal in oceanography. Uh, the runtime can handle any depth profile of IOPs, and you can save output. You know, if you want to save output at every millimeter, you can do that. It's stupid, but you could do it. And more than likely you're going to want to save the output at, you know, five meter intervals or maybe out here at one meter intervals or you might want to save it like at one meter and two meters and then five and then 15. You know, anything like that you can do. There's no approximations 
in the RTE except that it doesn't include polarization. Uh, you know, you have to specify all the input, but there's a graphical user interface that we'll learn to run in a minute that basically just asks you a lot of questions about what do you want for this input, what do you want for that input, and then it collects all your answers together and then gives that to the Hydrolyte code itself. So that makes it sort of easy to run, and then there's various ways to look at output. Uh, there's printout, there's Excel. Uh, you can open certain outputs in Excel files, and there's IDL routines, which are basically like MATLAB routines and so on. So anyway, uh, the way people tend to use Hydrolyte is you have this question that says something like, well, you know, what if I change the phase function? You know, I, I think I'm going to guess one phase function, and maybe it's correct, but maybe I used a different one. How much difference would that make? in something I'm interested in, like the in-water irradiance or the remote sensing reflectance. Well, in the ocean, even if you went out and major, measured the phase function and measured the remote sensing reflectance and you got the answer for that phase function, you can't just some way do an experiment in the ocean and say, if it had a different phase function, what would I have gotten? But you can in hydrolyte. So it gives you a controlled environment for playing games about what if I change this or what if I change that. Um, and that's probably the way it's, maybe the most commonly way it's used. Uh, some people, maybe you have underwater imaging data that you're down there, you've got your camera, you look at this thing over there, and part of the light you're detecting is ambient light and parts coming off of light reflected off your object. You may use hydrolyte to compute the ambient light field, subtract it from what you measured, and get a better uh, image of what you were actually interested in underwater. And, you know, people use it for predicting what the light field would be uh, for particular inputs. And in the case here, we're going to use it to teach you guys some radiative transfer equations without having to spend the next six months going through the mathematics. Okay, a little warning, which is out of the user's guide. As I've already said, it's really a radiative transfer model. It's not a model that knows anything about the oceans. So you have to put in all of the inputs. And all I can guarantee you is that for, for whatever inputs you give it, it will give you the solution to the radiative transfer equation very accurately. So if your inputs are good, your solution's good, if your inputs are not any good because you did a bad scattering correction on your AC9 data or whatever, then you'll get a perfectly good solution for that set of data, but it's not going to correspond to the real world. So it's garbage in, garbage out. And the way a lot of people use it is they say, well, look, I didn't measure the phase function. I have some AC9 data, I have something else, but no phase function. So they guess a phase function. They run hydrolyte. They compare the remote sensing reflectance with the one they measured. And maybe hydrolyte's value is way too big. And they say, OK, I guessed a phase function that had too much backscatter. So let's try a different phase function. And now, you know, I, instead of 2% backscatter, I'll use 1%. Well, now hydrolyte's remote sensing reflectance is maybe smaller than the one you measured. So then you say, well, I guessed wrong again. Maybe I should use a phase function with 1.5% backscatter. And they iterate back and forth until they get something close to agreement with their measurement. And then they say, OK, this is probably what the phase function looked like out in nature. And so they've actually solved an inverse problem by doing that. And a lot of people use it in that mode. They, they tweak the inputs until they get agreement with something they measured. And they've then sort of filled in the blanks of the things that they didn't actually measure. OK, a little comment. Uh, you know, here's an actual AC9 profile. Somebody ran through Hydrolyte in a previous class. It had 2,000 values and a lot of electronic noise on it. And they ran this through Hydrolyte. But look, you know, you really, the, the real ocean didn't have absorption and scattering profiles with this kind of noise. That's just instrument noise. So you need to some way smooth this data, bend it. I think in this case I said I bend it to uh, 25 centimeter depth bends. And now I still have the same general 
behavior here. I just offset this so you could see it. And, you know, maybe there's some real physics here. You know, this an increase in absorption here at about five meters and decrease. And, you know, maybe these are real little thin layers here. Maybe there's a little decrease here. That's probably real. But that kind of noise is not real. So you need to clean up your data. Look at your data. If there's, you know, bad data there, throw it out, smooth it, bend it, do whatever you want. But then you'll be able to give the data to Hydrolyte and have something reasonable. And I just had a person two weeks ago took a raw AC9 file. It had 4,600 depths that were literally some of them less than a millimeter apart. And this person just like read the file into Hydrolyte. And the first thing it said was, you know, it started reading the file and then it put out this rude error message that says, your depths are not in increasing, or your data are not in increasing order with depth. And at this point, she just had no idea what to do because I was profiling and the AC9 was going down in the water and now Hydrolyte says my depths are not in increasing order. Well, yeah, the cable was playing out, but the ship was going up and down. So the AC9 went like this and up like this and down like this and up like this. And she just took this file and sticks it in. And Hydrolyte looks at it and says, well, you know, I'm at six meters and now, I don't know, six, 6.1, 6.2, 6.1. Whoa, wait a minute. I need to see the depths in increasing order. <clears throat> well, it turns out she hadn't even scattering, done the scattering correction, hadn't removed water or anything. It was just complete disaster. So needless to say, Hydrolyte wasn't giving her good results because she had not cleaned up her data smoothed it, bend it, and all of that. Okay, uh, there's, in the code you have, there's both hydrolyte and ecolyte. Now, hydrolyte is solving for the full radiance distribution. And ecolyte is a fast version that instead of solving for the radiance in each little window here, it only solves for it in bands of latitude. And the reason is when we're going to compute an irradiance, for example, we're going to take the radiance distribution and integrate it over all of these, let's say the downwelling directions to give me ED. So if I computed, I spent a lot of money, a lot of computer time, getting each one of the radiances here, and then I turned around and I integrated over all of them to get an irradiance. So I kind of did a lot of calculations that I really didn't need. Well, the Ecolite thing, it solves an azimuthally averaged version of the RTE and just gets the radiances azimuthally averaged in these bands. And then when you want to compute an irradiance, then it only has to integrate over theta. <coughs> well, that's a lot faster numerically, and you end up with the same irradiance in either case. If you really need to know the radiance in this direction versus that direction, you're on Hydrolyte. If all you need is an irradiance or a nadir viewing remote sensing reflectance, then you can run Ecolite. And you'll get to basically the same answer, you know, to within a fraction of a percent due to little numerical differences. So anyway, when you run Hydrolite at the end, you'll, you'll, you'll go through the user interface, and then the very last form, it'll say, do you want to run Hydrolite or do you want to run Ecolite? You can click the Hydrolite button. Maybe it takes 30 seconds to run. Then you can click the Ecolite button and it'll take two seconds to run. And then you look at the output and you'll have the same irradiances in either case. Uh, the runtime in Hydrolite is proportional to the number of the little windows squared plus some fixed overhead. And so the standard quad distro, or the windows, they're 10 degrees in theta and 15 degrees in phi. So there's 24 phi windows in the phi direction and there's 20 in the theta direction. So that's 0 to 180 by 10, but then there's a couple of polar caps. So it takes basically this much run time, but Ecolite doesn't have the phi uh, uh, windows. It only has the theta windows. So it's running basically 24 squared times as fast. And that can be anywhere from 20 to 1,000 times faster depending on all some details of how you actually do the run. Okay, enough said there. Um, the software package that you got 
there's a graphical user interface that runs on some version of Windows. And I don't have Windows 8, but in a couple of previous classes, people were running it on Windows 8 and it ran OK. So that's what you're actually going to run on your computer. Then there's a whole bunch of databases and IOP models and such that are built into it. So you can run the user interface and you say, you know, I want to go get this data value. I want to use this IOP model. That's all built in. This collects together all of your file names and options and so forth. And then, for example, adds up all of your component IOPs to get the total IOPs, gives that to these core math routines that actually solve the RTE. And that's, you know, I don't know, a few tens of thousands of lines of mathematics there that you don't want to see. And then to look at the output, there's a print file or, or output file that's made to, you know, open up and look at with a text editor. I really recommend you always look at the printout because that's where any error messages will be. And then there's some of the output you can open with Excel and look at it as a spreadsheet. And then there's some files that are formatted to be opened in IDL to generate plots. And uh, we'll probably, you know, we'll just play with this stuff here unless you happen to have IDL on your computer. So the bottom line here is that most people assume that I was some way funded to develop Hydrolyte by the Navy or NASA or somebody like that. Uh, it's not the case. I never got any funding at all to develop Hydrolyte except the, the U.S. Naval Research Lab gave me the money to add inelastic scatter and the Office of Naval Research gave me the money to develop the little front end user interface. But uh, the core code itself all came uh, on my own nickel and with this fellow Rudy Preisendorfer who was the the guy that actually worked out the math. So it basically just like any other you know instrument it has to pay its way as a commercial product for new versions and and uh, you know user support and on all of that kind of stuff and so you know Satlantic doesn't give you free instruments because you're a student and I don't give you free hydrolyte because you're a student so anyway that's just life in the in the real world and I think personally that NASA should just give me a hundred thousand dollars a year and say Kurt put hydrolyte on the web for free and answer user support questions and put out free upgrades and all of that and we'll just pay you to do that but NASA doesn't see it that way so anyway uh, it is a commercial product of this company I work for and the code that I'm giving you is an executable version of the code. Now, normally when you license Hydrolyte, you get the source code. And some people want to say, look, I would just like to have my output in a file that's just what I want, and it's just this format, etc. So they can go in, change the source code, write, in, write out a file that's just what they want, and, uh, or they want to write their own little IOP model or whatever it happens to be. Well, you can do that with the source code. Um, and I also give you a Fortran compiler to, so you can do that. Um, and the, the source code is all Fortran. Uh, so really, it runs on any computer with a Fortran compiler. But the user interface is written in Visual Basic. And that's why it only runs on Windows computers. OK, so anyway, the version you got is already compiled. And it does not have all of the features of the full-blown code. And it does not include the source code. But basically, it, it's 90% 90, 90 of what we'll need for anybody running Hydrolyte. And there's little timers in there that you can start the user interface 500 times. Now, you can start it once, and you can do 50 runs. But then you go to bed, and you start up your computer the next day. You start it. That's what's counted there. So 500 executions of the front end, or until August the 31st. So you've got it all the rest of this month and all of next month. And then after that, uh, if you try to run it, it erases your hard drive, and it sends a message to the Transportation Security Administration that you're a terrorist, so you'll never be able to get on another airplane. And it sends your name off to the National Security Administration as a member of uh, ISIL. So anyway, that's the way it works. 
Um, and one little photo here, I've rafted the Grand Canyon a couple of times. And one night, I just set my camera up on a tripod. I pointed it at the North Star, and I took some rubber bands and stuff, and I held down the, the exposure button, you know, and just let it run until the batteries ran down. And here's what came out. What's interesting, so here's the North Star, here's the rim of the Grand Canyon looking up, is the different colors of the stars that came out on the film. And this was film, not digital. This photo is like 15 years old. Um, so when you're outside at night with your eye, your eye is in its, uh, is it photopic, no, is it scotopic luminescence, scotopic or photopic? There's, there's one version of your eye that basically sees color during the day and needs bright light, and then there's the nighttime version that is more sensitive, but it doesn't detect color very well. It's pretty much black and white. So at night, when it's dark, your eye does not distinguish colors well at all. But the film did. So you can see, you know, there's red stars, there's blue stars, there's white stars, there's some that are kind of yellowish. And I just thought it was really striking how many different colors of stars are that you can record on a piece of film, but you don't see with your eye. They just all look white. And I was reading a paper one time, and the guy made this statement that I thought, this cannot be right. So I contacted him, and I said, this is crazy. You know, I don't think you know what you're doing. Well, here's the question that was led to this conversation. If you're an astronomer and you're going to look at the like some little point of the nighttime sky that's as dark a spot as you can find, there's still light there because it's coming from starlight that's been scattered by interstellar dusts, dust and interstellar gases. And so the astronomers have a kind of standard background sky spectrum that when they want to make a spectrum of a star or some galaxy, well, they measure that, and then they subtract out this background sky spectrum, and that's just routine. Well, what color, if your eye could see the color of that background sky spectrum, what color do you think it would be? Any speculation? I just assumed it would be kind of a white color because it's basically stars like the sun being scattered, and so the sun looks white, so the background sky is just a very faint white spectrum. Bluish, we hear bluish purple, do we hear green, do we hear whatever else? It's actually a reddish orange, pumpkin colored spectrum. And I read this in the paper and I said, this cannot be right. Well, he set me straight. And the reason is most of the stars are actually what used to be called red dwarfs. And they're too faint to see with your eye, but they're low temperature stars that are putting out red light and all that red light is being scattered into your telescope so the sun is actually a little bit unusual it's a hot enough to be a white star and there's the occasional really hot blue white star but for example of the 20 of the 30 closest stars to the earth 20 are red dwarfs and you can't see any of them with your naked eye they're just too faint to see. So the actual background sky color is actually kind of a reddish orange. So shows you what I knew about astronomy, which is not much. I just thought I knew a lot. OK, so enough said. Let's fire this thing up. Or actually, first of all, let's actually look at what you hopefully have on your computer. So uh, that's fine. And you have version 5.2 here. OK, so if you look, let's, uh, OK, so on your computer, if you were one of the lucky ones where it installed and you didn't have a Macintosh or something, there's a code directory, for example. In yours, the directory's there, but there's nothing there uh, to speak of. But normally, you look in there, and here's Hydrolyte, and here's all the Hydrolyte source code. Yours doesn't have anything, so we don't have to worry about that. There is a data directory here, and in here are all these underlying data files for things like bottom reflectances and phase functions and 
you know, surface data is a function of wind speed and index refraction. Uh, here's the water absorption and scattering defaults file for freshwater. Here's the water absorbing and scattering defaults file for seawater. Here's one that's used by this RadTrans Sky model. There's a database of ozone that's used by the Sky model, you know, on and on and on. So there's all of these files that are built in there that are used by IOP models. There's a little sky model that's built in and so forth. So those are what's on the data directory. There's a documents directory that there is a, uh, there's a big volume called Hydrolyte User's Guide that basically just tells you step by step, here's how to run the code, you know, form by form by form, here's what goes in. And then there's a separate technical document. These are like 100 pages. So if you have a question like, well, how does Hydrolyte model the absorption coefficient in the case one IOP model? Here it'll tell you. Here's the equations. How does it model sky irradiances? Here's how it does it. How does it compute Secchi depth? Well, here's how it does it. So I'll leave a couple of copies of these sitting around. I'll maybe put, you know, one set here and, and I'll leave. Uh, one set by my desk in the back. You know, feel, feel free to look at them. Uh, on the other hand, if you look in the documents directory, there they are as PDF files. So you can look there just as well. And then there's a bunch of other files here. If you have a question about, oh, uh, you know, how does Hydrolyte compute Secchi depths? How do you interpret Raman scattering? How does it handle its sky irradiances? All these other things. When I get a good question for some, from somebody about something, I often write up a little set of notes that says, well, here's the answer to your question in detail. And those are in that documents directory. So enough said there. There are some examples that come with Hydrolyte. Come on. So when you read through the user's guide, there's like four examples. And I give you all the inputs and outputs. So if you want to reproduce those example runs on your computer, you can then compare with the ones from my computer and see if everything's going okay. All right, so then uh, there's the front end here. So the actual front end code is this HE5 WinUI, Windows User Interface.exe. If you haven't done so, you know, right click on that guy and say create a shortcut. And you can then drag that over to your desktop, and then you click on that to run Hydrolyte. OK. Uh, then there's, uh, I, that actually shouldn't be there. I probably copied that in by accident. Then the other thing to look at is the output files. There's one for Ecolite, one for Hydrolyte. And then in each of those, there's a directory with the printout, a directory with the Excel stuff and a digital directory, which is the files made to be opened by IDL or something else. So we won't look at those right now, but we will in just a minute. And then there's actually a run directory here. When you go through the user interface, it creates a little file that's named I something, so which I stands for input. And you're going to give it a little name to identify your file. So these files actually have all of the input, all the answers from running the user interface. And they go off there. And then Hydrolyte runs, and it reads that file and puts the output into the output directory. And then there's a couple of other directories uh, for doing special things that we don't have to worry about in here. OK, so enough said. Let's actually do a run. So here's how it works. And I'm going to do like a really simple run and, and one other one, and then we'll turn it over to you guys. So when you first install Hydrolyte and you hit continue, it barfs because you have to go read the disclaimer that says, yeah, yeah, I know it's not fault tolerant. Don't sue Kurt. And uh, the entire risk is with you, et cetera. And don't use it if your life depends on it. And then there's the license agreement that has all this draconian stuff about you know, if there's a lawsuit, what state will it be in? And guess where I got this? I just copied it off the back of a Microsoft 
like office software package and I changed the word from you know copyrighted by Microsoft to copyrighted by me and th that's it so anyway you have to agree that <laughs> all of this stuff and then with luck it will run um, and if you actually have the code you know here's where to find me uh, or my programmer to ask for help but you'll have me in here okay so you've done this uh, we're now going to do a run so you hit continue and then the first thing there's a run ID form so the first thing you're going to do is cook up some name that will identify all of your input and output files and it says maximum of 32 characters and I recommend you do not put spaces in your file names because in Unix that's evil uh, Windows will probably handle it but sometimes things get weird so I might just call this something like DMC uh, run one you know whatever it is and then you'll see that this is going to be the root name for naming all of your files and then you can give it some little name here that might be uh, something like uh, first example for uh, lab one you know it's just some descriptive thing whatever you put here is going to get copied into the top of all of your files so when you come back next month it might say something like you know uh, iris c station number five you know july the 20th 4 20 p.m this latitude this longitude whatever it is that you're going to want to have later to identify your your run and then there's some change defaults and all of this we don't have to worry about we'll just go with those now okay the second form says all right dudes i need to know the iops number one thing so how are we going to do that well there's four or five different ways to specify the inherent optical properties the simplest one says i'm just going to do a run in one wavelength and you just give me total absorption total scattering and phase function so we'll do the first run with that one and then there's a couple of iop models for case one water i'll show you that one in a minute there's one where it says measured IOPs. They're obtained from user supplied AC and optionally BB files. So that could be an AC9 or an ACS. You might have a HydroScat 6, you might have a BB9, whatever. You can read your data files in and use that. Or maybe you want to build up models or IOPs for case two water where you've got water plus phytoplankton plus sea dom plus minerals well okay you can do that in there piece by piece and specify everything in great detail or maybe you have your own iop model where you've written an iop model that has 10 components yeah yeah so for every file that goes into hydrite we'll look at one of these actually the next class there's what I call a hydrolyte standard format. So you want to read in a chlorophyll profile, there's a particular format. You want to read in AC9 file, particular format. You want to read in a sky irradiance, particular format. We'll look at those next time when you start reading in your own data. Okay, so for the moment, let's just do the constant IOP. And notice a lot of times if you, uh, you leave your cursor there, there's a little tool tip it'll say either go see the technical documentation or here it'll tell you see light and water equations this and that and I really recommend you use the new case one model because it's presumably better but there's a little little helps like that that may keep you going okay so we do that and I've now said okay I'm going to use this constant the water is going to be homogeneous with depth just one wavelength and I put in a total absorption coefficient. So maybe 0.1, and you can hit tab and go down, let's say 0.4, and maybe I'm going to pick a pet salt phase function. Good enough. Uh, there's a bunch of ways you can do that. I could pick an isotropic one, or I could say, for example, I want to use this Fournier Ferrand phase function, and I want to have a backscatter fraction of, let's say, 0.015 so that would be one and a half percent backscatter if I pick this option 
It's going to go to the database, find these Fournier-Ferron phase functions, cook up one that has exactly one and a half percent backscatter fraction, and that's all then untouched by human hands at your level. And there's going I may use a sky model that needs to know a wavelength, so I put in a wavelength for that. But uh, really, it's not being used for the IOPs, just for the sky model. Okay, or the bottom model. So that's uh, one way to do it. So I've specified things there. And here in a second, it should come up and say, okay, uh, now I need to know if there's any internal sources or inelastic scatter. Notice the inelastic scatter has been grayed out. You can't, like, include Raman scattering or anything. Why not? Right. We're doing a run at just one wavelength, and the inelastic scatter, even at that wavelength, is coming from all these previous wavelengths, which we don't have in this run. So it's, it's uh, preventing you from doing something stupid. Now, the next run will do, say, 400 to 700 nanometers. It'll let us include fluorescence and Raman. Okay. Uh, wind speed, you know, go out on the dock, make your best guess. Five meters per second. Oh, I don't know. I thought it was actually three meters per second, so you can click there. Or if your brain thinks in terms of knots, or miles per hour, you know, put it in there and it'll do the conversion. And I think in your version, it only lets you do an index of refraction of 1.34, although in the full version that I have here, I can put in a temperature and salinity and let it tweak this number a little bit. But that's the least of your worries. And then uh, it says sky model. So notice what we're doing is we're fixing up the air water surface boundary conditions. So I need a wind speed, what's the index refraction of the water compared to air, and then what's the sky? Well, there's two options for the sky. There's the normal one we'll use maybe in the next run, and this one it says use an idealized sky model. So if you wanted to simulate something like the sun in a black sky or a solid overcast, you could pick that and say, give me a uniform background sky and let the total irradiance be one watt per square meter per nanometer and put the sun at 30 degrees and, you know, so on down. And so you can use that. Let's just go ahead and pick that. Uh, and then it says, okay, bottom boundary condition. First of all, how deep is the water? Well, if you pick that it's infinitely deep, what hydrolyte will do is figure out really the BRDF of an infinitely deep ocean below the last depth where you ask for output. So let me explain that. It's a little tricky. On the next form, it's going to say, what depths do you want me to save the output at? And so we're going to do a run here. So here's output. Well, actually, let's do IOPs. And here's depth. OK, so I'm going to tell Hydrolyte I want you to save the run always at depth zero minus, which means just below the sea surface. And I want you to save the output at depth one and two and five and eight, let's say. Okay, so then you put in some IOPs, and here's what your IOPs look like as a function of depth. And so Hydrolyte says, okay, the last depth he asked for was eight meters. And this was the IOP value at 8 meters. So what it really does is it says, I'm going to assume the IOPs are constant below that last depth. And it's going to fix up a BRDF that describes an infinitely thick layer of water with these IOPs, and it's going to kind of stick it at 8 meters. And that's how it does the bottom reflectance. Now here's the catch. Let's say Maybe you're only interested in the water leaving radiance. So that RRS is only coming from the first few meters. So you say, well, I don't really care what's going on at eight meters, so I'm just going to run hydrolyte down to maybe two meters. Well, then it's going to say, okay, here's the IOP at two meters, and I'm going to take the IOP's constant below that, fix up this BRDF, 
and stick it at two meters because that's the last depth you ask for. Well, that's really a different radiative transfer problem than this one. And if the water is clear enough that you could see the bottom at two meters, you're going to get a different RRS for this run than you will for this one because you've really solved a problem with this IOP profile, not with this IOP profile. So even though you're only interested in something like remote sensing reflectance, you want to make sure you run the code deep enough that whatever's going on down here is not affecting what you're interested in up here. It's a little strange, but that's, that's just the way the math works. So on the other hand, if you said put the bottom at five meters and then make it a, uh, a you know, a seagrass bottom, then it's going to put the bottom here at five meters and it's going to use a BRDF for seagrass at five meters. And that's how it fixes up the bottom boundary. Okay, you'll do some runs to play with different bottom types and see what happens to remote sensing reflectances. So anyway, one way or another, you have to tell it about what kind of bottom you want. If it's infinitely deep, you're done. If you had picked finite depth, then it's going to say, oh, I need to know about the bottom reflectance. Well, maybe it depends on wavelength, and maybe I'm going to browse down here, and it's going to be an average seagrass spectrum, something like that. So anyway, let's just use infinitely deep at the moment. Go to the next form here. Oh, and also now and then, there's a little notice like that that says, infinitely deep water selected, the water will be assumed homogeneous below the deepest output depth with IOPs equal to those at the depth. And that's just kind of reminding you of what I just said right here. And you get sick of looking at those little warnings. So you can say, OK, I understand it. Don't show me this again. OK, now it says, what depths do you want the output saved at? Uh, well, let's say we run it down to uh, 50 meter or 50 here. <coughs> and maybe we want to save at every 5. And then in this case, it says, is this 50 meters or is it 50 optical depths? I can go either way when I only have one wavelength and the water's homogeneous, it's easy. So let's do a run in terms of 50 optical depths. Okay, so I'm going to do the output will be at 0, down at 5, 10, 15, 45, and then 50 is where the output will be saved. Now, the resolution where I save the output doesn't affect the solution of the radiative transfer equation. So you're not going to get a more accurate solution if you use a one meter spacing here as opposed to a five meter. And the reason is what's going on inside hydrolyte is here's your IOPs, whatever they look like, and you say save it at one meter, save it at two meters, save it at five meters. Hydrolyte, when it's doing the math, is actually taking these really small steps that are like order 10 to the minus sixth optical depths. So it's solving these equations, and then it says, oh, one meter, write this out. And then it takes these little bitty steps, and it says, oh, two meters, he wanted to save the output, write it out. Now, if I had said, I only want to see the output every five meters, it wouldn't have done these saves here. It would have just integrated down, and then it would have finally said, oh, I'm at five meters, write the output. So you still would have done exactly the same solution in between. Just something to, you know, kind of keep in the back of your mind that you can, you can sort of skip depths that you're not interested in. Question, yeah. I don't remember if I saw it on the previous uh, screen, but can you put in your own reflectance, bottom reflectance yeah. measurements? Yeah, yeah. So if you've got like measured mud from the Damascata River that you measured the reflectance, you put that on a file in its standard format, 
you add it to the data directory here. I can show you how to do that. And then you can pull down and say Damariscotta River Mud, and it'll use that. Okay, so for the moment, let's just go ahead and say we're going to use optical depths. And then you get to the final form. We've gone through and answered all these questions. Now, a lot of times, all you want to do in the next run is change one thing, sun angle or phase function or whatever. You don't want to have to answer all the questions again. So you can click there and say, save these inputs for the next run. And then you can just real quickly click, click, click through the thing, change the one number, and do it. Uh, OK, so it says, begin the hydrolyte run now. Let's do it. Let me just, uh, yeah, let's just do that. So click there, and it says, don't, don't do any new runs till this one's completed. And basically, at the best, all you're going to do is do two runs at once, and each run of them is going to run half as fast as, you know, you, you don't save anything. And sometimes things may get mixed up if you try to do two simultaneous runs. I, so I just recommend do the run, wait till it's done, and then put in the next run. Uh, okay, so it's running, and it's going to take a couple of seconds here maybe. Okay, it's over. All right. Uh, so it says now up here that hydrolyte's finished. You can now take a look at the output. Fine. Let's just do the Ecolite run. It's all the same inputs exactly. It's just going to run a diff solve a different radiative transfer equation. Let's just click do the Ecolite run, and boom, it was over in like two tenths of a second as opposed to four seconds because Ecolite runs faster. All right, now let's take a look at some outputs here. So uh, I see uh, once I go to this uh, screen resolution, I've now lost my little things at the bottom here. So let's fire up. Oh, God, what a pain in the butt. Let's fire up um, Windows Explorer. Where, pray tell, is that? Oh, it's under, um, it's under, where do they hide that? Uh, yeah, here, here we are. Uh, wait, yeah, okay, let's just do this. Okay, yeah, here we go. So now, whoops, I need to have lunch with the guys at Microsoft and talk to them about some of this stuff that's a real pain in the butt. Uh, yeah, here we are. So here's HE52 and whoops, HE52 output. Let's look at Hydrolyte. Let's go to the printout. Whoops. And go to the last one done. Where did it go? Okay. Ah, date modified. Okay, here's the one I just did, the printout for DMC run one. Okay, so let's just look through that. And what you see, well, there's a list of like what depths and angles and so forth. And then it starts giving you information that says IOP model, well, you use this A and B are constant ones. The absorption coefficient was 0.1, B was 0.4. The phase function was having a backscatter fraction of 0.015. And then it says there was no inelastic scattering, no Raman, no chlorophyll fluorescence, fine. Atmospheric specifications that I used this simple model, and the sun was, you know, the total irradiance was one, and uh, then there was. Uh, the ratio of the sky to the total was 0.3, so it was 0.7 was the sun and 0.3 was the background sky and, you know, so on and so on, just to document the sky conditions. There's the air water surface had a wind speed of 3, etc. The bottom boundary was infinitely deep, homogeneous water below optical depth, that would say 50 out there. So there's just a bunch of stuff that when you 